liberals, not the conservatives, are the one who pound, pound, pound. Welcome to Down Ballot. We do the show live every Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Pacific right here on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media for checking out the podcast. Thank you for checking out the podcast. Um, I'm producer Dave. You can find me damn near anywhere. Uh, the councilman's having uh, some technical hiccups and he'll be just uh, kind of jumping in on the fly during the show this evening. Uh, we use a technology called OBS Ninja, or sorry, VDO Ninja that allows that to be a possibility. Um, this show's an offshoot from our Sunday show, The Plex. We were doing local news at the beginning of the Sunday show, but uh, if anybody's a viewer or listener of the Sunday show, you know that there's just a lot of shit going on, and sticking that at the beginning of the Sunday show wasn't really working out, especially sometimes we'd end up with, I don't know, half an hour of local news, and then like we'd only have like a half an hour on the pod for that, for uh, our regular stuff. So that's what's up with Down Ballot. You can find this on all of your podcatchers, and once again, podcast listeners, make sure you're following us on Twitch. It's twitch.tv slash echoplex media 
And uh, <clears throat> the councilman actually won't be joining us uh, this week. We'll have him uh, with us next week. Um, so it's a homo alono tonight. I hope you guys don't mind. We have um, a bunch of stories on the docket, all kinds of great local stuff, and uh, I'll be talking about it uh, by myself tonight. And uh, always remember, too, we have local love after this. That starts at 9 p.m. Pacific. Go ahead and make sure you're following the local love podcast on your podcatcher of choice. And uh, if you're watching Down Ballot this evening, make sure you do stick around for local love because local love is fun. So uh, we have a couple different categories on this show, Down Ballot. We got Leading Off, we got Winners and Losers, we got Get Your Shit Together, we got Down Ballot Watch, and we got And Another Thing. And Leading Off is exactly what you think it is. It's just the fucking first story we cover every week. The story comes to us from uh, KTV Fox 2 in uh, San Francisco, and this is about a bar that serves non-alcoholic beverages. New at 10, a San Francisco man is planning to open the city's first non-alcoholic speakeasy. This will include more than 100 mixers and drinks, all without alcohol. As KTV's Alyssa Harrington tells us, the bar owner says there's a huge demand for boozeless beverages, and he calls his speakeasy the bar of the future. Let's see what we got. Joshua James shakes up a mezcal madre, a signature drink at Ocean Beach Cafe in San Francisco. But this drink and all beer, wine and spirits here are completely 100 percent non-alcoholic. Everybody's getting in the game like Lagunitas. These are the top guys in the space. James is the owner of the cafe and quit drinking two years ago. He carries roughly 100 different types of zero proof drinks, including craft beers. There's even some big brand names like Budweiser. The non drinker didn't have a lot of options and like they were OK with seltzer water or Diet Coke or whatever. And um, all of a sudden, all of these products came out. So that was a huge part of it. But there was another part, and, and that was COVID happened. James believes the pandemic got people to start prioritizing their health. He's noticing a huge demand for boozeless drinks, whether customers are looking to cut back, quit drinking, or are sober curious. James now plans to open the city's first non-alcoholic speakeasy. It will be invite only with events as well. There is a shift in culture itself. There's a shift in drinking culture, which is a subset of that. And there, the, the leaders of this industry and food and beverage professionals and all the movers and shakers in the non-alcoholic beverage industry are going to be invited here to, to talk about those things. The speakeasy is named Temperance Bar after the temperance movement to limit drinking. <laughs> Across town in the Mission, there's a non-alcoholic vending machine at Hawker Fair called a Nano Bar. You scan a QR code, you walk through the prompts, and it uh, allows you to open the door and you grab a can of your choice. General Manager Dolly Valdez Bautista says they are constantly restocking. She says even though dry January is over, the trend is sticking around. Non-alcoholic drinks right now are about 10% of our total beverage sales. Nielsen data predicts buzzless beverages will be one of the biggest trends of 2022. Last year alone, consumers spent $3.3 billion on no and low alcohol products. Italian bubbly. I'm Alyssa Harrington, KTVU, Fox 2 News. I mean, I guess whatever. <clears throat> it does kind of suck when you go to a bar if you don't want to drink. There's like nothing to drink there. Like there's like soda and like flavorless soda water. Some bars have coffee, but then like maybe you also are not interested in staying up all night because you drank coffee at the bar. This isn't a bad idea, though. This guy's uh, invite only speakeasy seems like some fucking shitty rich tech guy thing, tech bro thing, right? Like why invite only? Like that doesn't make any sense. Like why, why wouldn't you just open your bar to the public? But maybe it's small. I don't know. Maybe he wants it to be exclusive. Invite only is like, you better, you better have like a strong clientele if you go invite only. I bet this guy, I bet this guy worked at Twitter or something and like cash out his stock options or whatever and wants to do this instead. It's weird. It's weird. But yeah, I, that bar, the second one they showed where they had that vending machine with all these, you know, interesting non-alcoholic beverages, even if you've, even if you do drink, but you're like, I'm done for the night, like I'm done for the night, you know, um. You know, I'm going to want to sleep well, so I don't want to go to bed drunk or whatever. That's a great idea, sticking that uh, vending machine there. I think the second one was the sauce. That was the right one where you, you have this vending machine available. I, the QR code and shit, it's a little weird, but like whatever.
that that doesn't bother me that much but yeah i think the first one was a little weird i think the second one that lady nailed it i think she nailed it she has just the right thing right there so we'll see how this guy's business does. Although this is one of those stories, right? We talk about this a lot on this show, how like a lot of these local stories, we'll hear about the thing once and then we never fucking hear about it again. And I think that's going to be one. That's this. This is definitely going to be one of those stories where we're just never going to hear about it again. Cause what are they going to do a follow up on this guy's uh, non boozy bar? I wonder like a boozeless bar. Are there still bar fights? <laughs> do people still poorly play darts at a boozeless bar? Like a lot of, a lot of things, I wonder if a lot of like bar culture comes along with it, especially the fights. I wonder if there's bar fights at the Boozless Bar. So that was our leading off story. We're going to move on into winners and losers. Uh, winners and losers is where uh, either no one wins or if somebody does win, it's really not who you're rooting for. This first story is about a local restaurant chain that's down to one location. I'm not exactly sure where the location is, but I remember as a kid going to Marie Callender's. And uh, it was right next to the Bob's Big Boy, and we'd always go there. The food was kind of shitty, but dessert was incredible. They always had really good pies. So here's a local story about Marie Callender's going, well, not going away, but being down to one location. A sour ending to nearly 50 years of sweet business in the South Bay. The last Maria Calendars in San Jose officially closed for good. This afternoon, the restaurant on Blossom Hill Road, best known for its pies. It's been around for 49 years. It is closing. The franchise owner, Ron Gerald, was the first general manager when the restaurant opened in 1974. At the time, he was 17. Like so many places, the pandemic crushed business so bad that he says he just can't afford to keep it open. Well, I'm sad to see them go. I've been coming here for at least 25 years. They had great Sunday brunches, and their pies are the best. I don't believe them about the Sunday brunch. It is sad to see it go. The Bay Area has just one Marie Callender's left in Sunnyvale. The only other location in Northern California, Sacramento and Modesto. Yeah, that's sad. <clears throat> but I didn't believe that guy's story about brunch. The food there was never that good, but the fucking dessert was incredible. They also had, like, I don't know, I think they, the one in Fremont where I grew up, I think they like made their own ice cream and shit too. It was amazing, but I don't know. I just put it on there because I remember going there with my parents and my sister a lot when we were kids. It was it was pretty good. Um, although sometimes we'd go somewhere else for dinner and then go to Marie Callender's for dessert for, you know, whatever reason. So this next story is the most Silicon Valley shit in the world. Um, I don't know if this is a winner or a loser, but there's a... A real estate market that's booming, but it's for pretend real estate. Did you know the hottest real estate market is not in the Bay Area? In fact, it's not even in our world. It's at your fingertips. And in tonight's original report, how properties are selling like hotcakes in the metaverse. Looking to buy some property? Well, the Bay Area market is notoriously expensive, so why not widen your search? Today I'm going to give you a quick demo of our newest land offering. And invest in a plot of digital land. It's something we've been seeing more and more from all sorts of video game companies already. And now it's starting to push into the mainstream. Virtual real estate exists in 3D spaces found only online in what's loosely called the metaverse. These digital worlds include Decentraland, the sandbox, and the first one on the block, Second Life. I'm just going to. Okay, this is just Second Life, how you were able to like buy shit on Second Life. For fuck's sake. But that was it. this is just like Second Life all over again. It, but it's but like the tech bros are like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna buy a fucking condo. Like, Shut the fuck up. People can't afford their rent. I'm gonna build this virtual world because that's what I wanted to see happen, and I wanted to see what would happen if people were enabled to enter into a big shared single space. Users jump in as digital characters known as avatars. Anything is possible from a trip to Africa to having a front row seat at Fashion Week. These avatars are spending lots of real money that's been exchanged into digital currency. His second life has this huge economy around people making interesting things and selling them to each other. By the way, not in speculation. You know, the interesting things are things like jewelry for your avatar or clothing or furniture or uh, just about anything. Now, owning virtual property is attracting significant investment. There's only so much land to go around. So 
uh, the value is going to need to go up. Michael Gord is co-founder of the Metaverse Group. A ver- no, there's not only so much land to go around. No, that's not true. They're like art making artificial scarcity. There's not only so much land to go around. What the fuck are you talking about? Are there only so many fucking pixels? Shut the fuck up. Oh, I hate this. I'm so glad I found this. Put it on the docket. Estate company. His group just bought digital property in one world for close to two and a half million dollars. Oh, shut the fuck up. Nobody, nobody can afford a house. I, this is fucking infuriating, right? Like, is anybody else mad? It's. It's not just ridiculous. It's fucking infuriating. Gord has seen an exponential growth in users and for lucrative business opportunities in all kinds of brands. Everyone in the world is going to be using the metaverse in a, in a few years. A leading cryptocurrency asset management group sees the metaverse as a trillion dollar business opportunity. Snoop Dogg bought property where he plans to throw private digital parties and release music. JP Morgan Chase just opened up the metaverse's first digital bank branch. An international accounting firm Prager Metis built this virtual three-story building to advise clients. The first time I read this, it kind of blew my mind because I was like, these guys don't mess around with money. Like accountants tend to be very conservative. Christy Waterworth writes about real estate investments. She says buying virtual property is like buying in the real world. You don't want to buy in the wrong neighborhood and there are no guarantees. It's very speculative and jumping in right now is very risky. Even so, tech titan Mark Zuckerberg jumped in and in fact changed the name of his company from Facebook to Meta. He sees the future in virtual worlds, even though his stockholders aren't so sure. Second Life has a million users. Its founder believes it's not yet for everyone. I think the real world is our home and we need to protect it. I think that we're not just easily going to flip all of us into a virtual world. So of all these people, I hate the second life guy the least because he was like, he did this first and also he's smart enough to have the same microphone I have. He just doesn't have the right windscreen on it, but like, what the fuck? Like, yo, we just got out of a, or we're just hopefully getting out of the worst of a pandemic or whatever. Although we've said that a few times, people couldn't afford their rent. Some states bailed people out, some states didn't, and they're getting evicted. So if you're like, you know, on the verge of eviction, and then you see this news story, you're also on the verge of needing a new TV because you just threw your coffee table through your TV, right? Like, (laughs) what the fuck? I just, there's just no, there's just no words for how stupid this is and how, how like, why can't these dumb rich people just give like, Why can't they just go around and write checks to regular people instead of buying like pixels? So here's a video from a local news about how to discuss the uh, in the how to discuss the Russia Ukraine crisis with children. This is from NBC Bay Area. This is probably also going to be fucking infuriating. Images of the Russian invasion of Ukraine are hard for anyone to watch. But this is also the first major war with minute-by-minute updates on social media that is seen by so many kids as well. Yeah, today in the base, Chris Sanchez, she's joining us now. And Chris, you are as a parent. You've looked over this a while. What should parents say to those kids when they have those tough questions? Well, the tough question that I got from my youngest, who's 13 years old, is, is daddy going to go? My husband's a journalist. He's covered a number of wars over the years. And I suspect that a lot of families with military connections might be getting similar questions from their kids about what the U.S. involvement and the extent of that, what that's going to be going forward. Uh, Because of the volume of images on TV and now on social media, especially of children either still in Ukraine or in those really rough refugee 
these situations far from their homes, your child may have a lot more questions about this particular incident. Now, I asked people to weigh in on Facebook. One mom says she's using her experience growing up in the Cold War to put things in perspective. One dad says he's only answering the questions that his daughter's bringing up and then trying to make connections with the impact here at home like gas prices. Another dad says his daughter's fifth grade teacher talked about it in class and then the class role played as NATO nations. I thought that was a really good way to do. No, it. that's a really bad idea. Experts keep it age appropriate. You know what your kids can handle. Also vet their information for. Oh, that's the problem. A lot of people are going to the great. Now we're going to have parents like fucking distributing Russian propaganda to their fucking nine year old when talking about the invasion of Ukraine. Fuck. Let's <laughs> talk about credible sources and for younger kids make sure you know where they're learning about the war and if they are anxious ask them specifically what's scaring them and empower them with ways to help like making a donation or attending a support rally now nbc news's nightly kids has a good explanation of how we got here in case you know you're not up to date on ukraine russia relations if you want to check that out you can find a link on my facebook page but as in all difficult conversations and we've had a lot of them over the last couple of years the experts say let your child guide the conversation so that you answer what's bothering them without introducing something new giving them something else to to worry about and of course our kids are all different ages so we're having different conversations in our homes images of i think this one might be left best left to the teachers <laughs> like a teacher goes through all kinds of certification you've got to go through no kind of certification to be a parent I think some of them might be best left to the schools. Um, <clears throat> maybe some of the schools won't touch it or don't want to do it because it's politics. And there's a lot of pressure on schools right now, uh, like around critical race theory or fucking bathrooms again. But I, I just don't think that like, I don't think that most parents are really equipped to like explain this shit to their kids. And like I said, you will be like, well, you know, there's two sides to everything here. Here's what here's what I learned from um, Reuters, and here's what the Russia Today said. So I just don't know, honey. Just don't know. Putin sure looks great on that horse, though. I don't know what the... Sometimes down ballot makes me annoyed and angry. But sometimes there's interesting kind of strange stories. So I don't know if anybody remembers that. I, I guess a gentleman named Scott Peterson isn't the right way to put it scott peterson probably killed his wife and uh he was i think he uh confessed and now he's like trying to appeal his confession and he's back in court here in the bay area because i believe they were from the san mateo county and so here's a couple news hits about him um back in court he's a bit, he was a bit of a celebrity because he was kind of good looking we live in a fucked up world Felon Scott Peterson was back in a Redwood City courthouse hoping to overturn his guilty verdict for killing his wife. His argument centers on claims that a juror lied to get on the jury. As NBC oh, he didn't Area's plead Robert out. Honda explains today that accused juror took the stand. Well, just one juror can make a difference, and that's why the jury selection process is so crucial. And Scott Peterson's defense team made it clear they never would have picked this juror if she had been more forthcoming. Rochelle Nice was known as juror number seven when Scott Peterson was on trial about looks fly. years ago for the murder of his wife Lacey and their unborn son. Nice and the other jurors convicted Peterson in a case that generated headlines nationwide. But now she is on the stand in the same Redwood City courthouse as Peterson tries to get a new trial on the basis of juror misconduct, claiming Nice lied on her jury selection questionnaire by not disclosing information discovered on two separate restraining orders. One involved a woman who Nice said was stalking her, and the other followed a physical confrontation with the juror's boyfriend. Both happened while Nice was pregnant. Today, Nice testified she didn't reveal being a victim of a crime because she never felt like a victim. Legal analyst Stephen Clark says that omission boosts Peterson's case. And you will see the linkage between her pregnancy and the fear for her child when she was a victim of the crime, and they will draw the parallel to Lacey Peterson. Clark also said Nice Nice's action after the trial showed how driven she was to be on this jury and that she knew the defense never would have picked her if she had revealed her history with claims of domestic violence. That she corresponded with Scott Peterson, she wrote about this trial, is going to suggest to the defense that she had a motive 
to get on the jury. Nice will return to the stand here on Monday. After that, at some point, Peterson's original attorney, Mark Garagos, is expected to testify to reinforce the point that she never would have been selected if he had known about her past experiences. Ironically, Nice says it was Garagos who kept her from being booted off in the first place. In Redwood City, Robert Honda, NBC, Bay Area News. Okay. So the, the she never would have been selected if we knew this. That's counterfactual. I, like, whatever, you can go on the fucking stand and say whatever you want. But they don't know. They don't know what they would have done because it didn't happen. Nobody, nobody knew about it. So they don't know what they would have done or what their feelings would have been or how that would have impacted the jury selection. So that was NBC News's coverage. Just for just for fun, I figured I'd uh, give us uh, ABC News's coverage of the same story, and I'm curious to see if they covered it in the same way, uh, mostly similarly or uh, differently. Let's check it out. Will Scott Peterson get a new trial? A hearing continued today to decide the fate of the convicted killer. At the center of the debate is a juror named Rochelle Nice. ABC 7 News reporter Zach Fuentes was in the courtroom today and heard her testimony. This is a continuation of Rochelle Nice's testimony from Friday. Only a still camera and sketch artist were allowed inside the courtroom and they were not allowed to capture her while she was in there. Now, to remind you, she is granted immunity from perjury. So if it's found that she lied on her questionnaire, she won't get in trouble for it. But Scott Peterson could get a new trial. Things turned emotional in court today when Rochelle Nice started crying when asked about letters she wrote Peterson after the 2004 trial. And she's sorry she sent the letters to... Um Mr. Peterson, she regretted doing that, and then she was asked about why that happened and gave us some testimony about that that you would have heard. She confirmed that she did write Peterson asking him why men cheat, referencing a boyfriend of five years who had cheated on her. Now keep in mind, Peterson's attorneys are trying to prove that Nice lied on her jury questionnaire, accusing her of being biased against Peterson who had had an extramarital affair. The center of this hearing is a question on that questionnaire that asked Nice if she had been the victim of a crime or involved in a lawsuit. She said no, but in 2000 and 2001, she was involved in a domestic dispute with her then boyfriend and one with his ex-girlfriend. She sought a restraining order saying at the time that she feared for her unborn child. Nice says that it was she who hit her boyfriend. He did not hit her. She says she later dropped the charges against his ex-girlfriend, and she says that she does not feel that she was a victim in either of those disputes, and that's why she says she didn't disclose it in the jury questionnaire. Peterson's attorneys are also trying to prove that she wanted to get on the jury for financial gain. They say they have another juror who could testify that she said she was having financial troubles and joked about book and movie deals. Today was the first day that the prosecuting attorney was able to cross-examine Nice. He asked her point blank if she had any bias against Scott Peterson during the jury selection process before the trial. She said no. The hearing is going to be continuing throughout the rest of the week. In Redwood City, Zach Fuentes, ABC7 News. Slightly different facts brought up. <clears throat> you notice the second one brought up that uh, she like dropped the charges because she said that she was possibly the aggressor. And uh, if there was no conviction there, then... It wasn't that there wasn't a crime committed, but there was no conviction there. So if she would have said yes, she might have been in trouble for perjury, right? Because there was, she wasn't, there was no, who, who, the person she had pressed charges against then uh, decided not to press charges against was never convicted. So that might have been a lie if she said yes. So I think this is nothing. I don't think that this, I don't think they're going to get a new trial. Uh, Maybe Scott Peterson should be found guilty of the same crime twice because it was a, if I remember the case, it was pretty cut and dry. <sighs> so our last story in winners and losers this evening is an update on, if you remember during the black lives matter protest, there was a federal agent killed in Oakland, California. And the first immediately after that happened, everybody was like, Oh, it was the black lives matters matter protest. It was black lives matters protest. Well, no, it was a fucking boogaloo boy. And the boogaloo is a sort of anti-government group. They are calling for, Civil War II, electric boogaloo. They think that, that we need to have a civil war to fix the country, um, to like take down the government and install a, a boogaloo-friendly government or whatever. And their beliefs are kind of all over the place, actually. They're not, not uh, exclusively far-right, but they <clears throat> employ the tactics and a lot of the rhetoric that far-right militias do employ. So here's an a update from, um, this is from, this is from ABC7 News here in the Bay Area on... Uh, a judge tossing a guilty plea out, which is pretty weird. What was the purpose of the grizzly scouts, Jesse? 
30-year-old Army veteran Jesse Rush of Turlock started the Grizzly Scouts in April 2020. And court documents show before long, he attracted at least 15 members to this offshoot of the Boogaloo movement, whose members believe a civil war or uprising against the government is coming. A militia in and of itself is not necessarily illegal. It's what the militia does, and it's how they act. Glenn Norling worked domestic terrorism cases exclusively for six years at the Sacramento FBI. He now trains law enforcement about threats from extremist groups. Court records show the Grizzly Scouts used a Facebook account named California Commando with the description, They say the West won't boog. We're here to gather like-minded Californians who can network and establish local goon squads. What is it about the Boogaloo movement that they want to target police officers? Yeah, and, and that's kind of one of the tenets. It's, it's the anti-government. It's the anti-law enforcement. We in law enforcement are, are attempting to take away their rights mm. and their privileges and things like that. So law enforcement is just that representative face, that local face of the government. One of the Grizzly Scouts, Stephen Carrillo, an active duty military police officer at Travis Air Force Base, who planned to attack officers during this George Floyd protest in Oakland, May 2020, and discussed it with the group. Court documents show 24-year-old construction worker Simon Ibarra met Carrillo in his white van behind a Los Gatos gas station and helped him assemble an automatic rifle. Two days later, Carrillo fired from that van at the Oakland Federal Building, killing security officer Pat Underwood. Even after that first killing, the Grizzly Scouts didn't turn Korea in. They kept discussing and planning future attacks. Hey, Simon, why didn't you turn in Korea after that first shooting in Oakland? No one raised a red flag and hey, and, and called law enforcement and said, look, it's gone too far. We've actually killed a, a, a law enforcement officer. They didn't do that. No, no, not at all. It was this was this was a furtherance of their cause. This is, you know, no holds barred. This is the beginning. This, this is the beginning of the book. This is why we've been training. This is what we've been training for. This is, this is serious. In fact, 22-year-old Kenny Mix of San Lorenzo messaged the group just one hour after the Oakland shooting. And so it begins. And the following week, when Santa Cruz County Sheriff's deputies tracked Carrillo to his Ben Lomond home, court records show the Grizzly Scouts were supporting him through WhatsApp, listening to police radios, urging him to escape law enforcement. This is what I do. During an ambush, Carrillo allegedly killed Sheriff Sergeant Damon Gutzweiler. And after his arrest, prosecutors say Rush, Ibarra, and Mix destroyed Grizzly Scouts' records and their communications with Carrillo. That's the crime for which they're now being prosecuted. The lawyers had worked out guilty pleas and sentences of 10 to 12 months, but Judge James Donato threw out the deal, saying they were dedicated exclusively and deliberately in a scheme to target and kill law enforcement officers, adding, I haven't seen a case that is more of a threat to public safety. None of the defendants or their lawyers would speak on the record today, except for Grizzly Scout leader Jesse Rush. Do you have any regrets about the death of Pat Underwood or Damon Gutzweiler? Yeah. What's that? Yes, do. You do have regrets? Want to tell me about that? We'll talk later, dude. This case is now set for trial in June. Another of the Grizzly Scouts has his sentencing in April. In addition to charges of conspiracy and obstruction, investigators say they found child porn in, on his computer. They enticed a 15-year-old girl to take and send dozens of photos and video. Yikes. I didn't know that about fucking, yo, the more, the more we learn about this fucking story with the Boogaloo boys, the worse it gets. Like, I don't know that the judge should have thrown all the whole thing out, though, because, like, like, what are they going to do now? Are they going to just do another plea bargain? Because the guy already pled guilty. So if he goes to trial, like he won't, he can't get a fair trial now that he already pled guilty to this. I don't know what the fuck the point. Why was the judge doing that? Like, what good did that do? Can the judge? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the point of that is. I think the judge just wanted to get on the fucking news. Like, I don't know if the prosecution and the defense made a deal <clears throat> just let them make the deal. But yikes, that part at the end with the images and enticing someone to take pictures of themselves and send it. Ugh, 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 fucking yikes. So that was winners and losers this week. Our next story is uh, get your shit together. Last week we had covered 
a uh, documentary series. We did, we didn't play any of the documentary series, but we're going to play the first episode of it this week. It's um, about saving San Francisco. So this is like going to be one of those like kind of tough on crime documentaries where, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're just saying that San Francisco is like a shithole or whatever. And San Francisco is fine. And the cities are dirty and messy and that's why people like to live in them. There's opportunity and there's tragedy in every city in America. And uh, everybody's been picking on San Francisco. Uh, they used to just say that all the gays live there and that's why they didn't like it. Now it's like, well, there's homeless people there. And it's like, well, the weather's good here. You know, you could do San Francisco or L.A. They'll kick you out of Phoenix. Plus, it's like a billion degrees in Phoenix. So anyway, here's episode one of Saving San Francisco. It's about a man in the woods. I'll be right back. I'm going to get some caffeine. I get to see the ocean. I get to smell the nature. I can hear the waves. Pretty magical to be able to live in a national park. I love this place. My name is Anne Ray and I live in the Presidio. I live alone at the edge of the park near a stand of woods. And I've Must been be here nice. for 15 years. This is my home. We're technically still in San Francisco, but this is yes. pretty remote. It's pretty remote, yeah. The what are they talking about? They can see a housing track from it. Anne knows that because she says over the past five years, she's called police and investigators over 50 times. At first, it was just packages stolen off her stoop and broken car windows in the neighborhood. But then one day, Anne's dog suddenly started barking. Something was going on outside of my door. And so I looked outside and got a very good view of him. You could actually see him trying to get into your house? Yeah, from the window, yes. What was that like? Very disturbing, pretty menacing looking. And so, yeah, it was scary. Could you actually see the door not moving from yeah. the inside? I worry about when I go to sleep at night, if he'll bust the windows and make it upstairs. And so I sleep with a taser and a single blade knife. You oh, she's kind of badass. Every night. Anne lives here on a quiet hillside near the ocean. This is San Francisco's Presidio, which spans about 1,500 acres along the northern tip of the city. It used to be a military base, but in the late 90s, the federal government started turning the barracks into housing. And so despite this place being a national park, it's home to more than 3,000 renters. That includes Anne and her neighbors. We went door to door in hopes of learning more about the man in the woods. He always tends to gravitate back towards this area. That's Chrissy Kenny. She's lived here for nearly a decade. Most of the residents who have been here for as long as we have, have all had some kind of an encounter with him. <laughs> a few doors down is Garner Swan. He's been here about eight years. Is it the best place for him to live? Probably not. Should he get help? Absolutely. Some neighbors didn't feel safe talking to us. This guy keeps knocking on apartment A. For me, it's, it's about my child and keeping her safe. Do you worry something could happen to her? Yes, I do, yes. I just know he's gonna come back here. Here he is outside Anne's place, dressed in all black, about 1 a.m. It's frightening, it's creepy. There's this guy who just watches me. Do you think he's become obsessed with you? Yeah, I do, and so do the detectives. So this is designed for us to see. He's left several messages in chalk outside her home. He wrote, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Yeah, hey, that's creepy. Although, I don't even know if that's him, right? We, we have no idea. And here he is ringing Anne's doorbell at about 5 a.m. Completely naked. Naked? Yeah. Did you worry he'd hurt you? Yeah. I mean, he's got very unpredictable behavior. He will, in one circumstance, be very timid and childlike. Then he's in a fist fight with officers or my neighbors. Anne says the man's obsession with her has only grown over the years. 
So he'd basically make this his home. One of them, yeah, absolutely. And we're not far from your house. No. It's creepy as you can imagine. He's got a fixation, which is increasing, on me. So it's scary. I live alone, and no one's going to hear me scream. You've thought about that before. Oh, yeah, I've thought about it a lot, actually. Yeah, for sure. That man is James Durgan. And in our search to find out who he is, we actually learned quite a bit about San Francisco. We're talking about the police, courts, prosecutors, and city hall. It's a system that should be working together, but parts of it are pretty broken. And if you live in San Francisco, you're the one paying for it, figuratively and literally. The city alone has a $12 billion annual budget. Billion with a B. That's more than many countries. But here, major retail stores have become crime scenes. Gun violence doubled last year. Burglaries are at the highest levels in recent history. Wait, so these are, <clears throat> this is completely disjointed. The person doing this documentary series just jumped from <clears throat> a real bad situation that it sounds like the, <clears throat> the city or county isn't handling well. And now they're just going to like things that happen in the city. Like in cities, these sorts of crimes happen. Car break-ins have spiked more than 170% in parts of the city. And despite a ballooning street cleaning budget, triple the size of other major cities, San Francisco is still averaging more than 80 complaints per day about feces on streets and sidewalks. That's the sad irony. It's such an incredibly wealthy and resourceful, beautiful city. It's not so pretty anymore. San Francisco may be the tech capital of the universe and one of the most progressive cities in America, but it's still struggling with homelessness, crime, drug use. And it turns out, so is James Durgan. He spent much of the past two decades in and out of jail. Law enforcement sources tell us he's been arrested about 60 times in San Francisco. He's been charged with 54 felonies and more than 100 misdemeanors. We also got a hold of hundreds of pages of his criminal records and found convictions for theft, violence, and drug use. Over the years, the court has ordered at least a dozen mental health evaluations. Federal records show he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and has undergone repeated treatment for an addiction to drugs, including meth. He's also had 16 restraining orders filed against him. Four of those from churches. A pastor at St. Dominic's accused him of trying to use their prayer candles to start a fire inside the church. When I started finding out about his history, I realized I needed to get a restraining order. She did. But James Durgan keeps coming back. I don't know what he's capable of. So what happens when police can't find him? He keeps slipping through the cracks. What happens when police lose him? He escaped from federal custody. This season on Saving San Francisco. He escaped from federal custody? That guy's fucking evil Spider-Man. A naked man ran right in front of my car, and all of a sudden I realized, whoa, that was Jim Durgan. It was written in black Sharpie, the word almost, on our door, and an arrow pointing to our doorknob. As in, like, I almost got in? Let him fall on the knife, and then got him. Yo, lady. The problem, he is a symptom of it. You've been mayor now more than three years, and these problems are still here. Some have argued they've even gotten worse. It's not as simple as that. It's been complicated. To really understand how Durgan got to where he is today, we felt like we needed to learn more about his past. So we came here, his hometown. There he is, James M. Durgan. He was the best friend I ever had. Somebody that just had a magnetism about him. It was the expression surrounding the eyes, kind of intense eyes. There was something kind of unhinged. I mean, I'm not a hurtful person, I'm not a harmful person. I'm gonna be somewhere in the future looking back on this knowing like, wow, that was all just someone else's story for me. So like, <clears throat> There's a couple things going on here. One, I don't like how they jumped from this. This dude is obviously a fucking problem. 
Um, possibly a problem of the system, not doing what the system should do. The person obviously needs some uh, mental health treatment. Possibly, <clears throat> as chat was saying, possibly to be institutionalized. I know we don't really do that anymore, but it seems like that might be the answer here, unfortunately. And, um, but then they just jump to like car burglary. And it's like, well, these are two very different things. Like every city has car burglaries. I, the city I live in, there's fucking car break ins all the time. And they were showing like for a couple of weeks there, people were looting high end retail stores. That, but that was organized crime. That had nothing to do with this guy that they were using on the lead in to be like, ooh, be afraid, be afraid. They like primed you with something that is actually terrifying. And then they, <clears throat> then they just like went to all this broken windows kind of shit that, that, that a lot of people like used to talk about. It's, this is like so far, this is kind of a shitty documentary. I know the guy, the guy's like doing this. He wants to get a Pulitzer prize or whatever the fuck for this documentary. But like the, so far it's kind of disjointed because they don't have anything to do with each other. So that was uh, get your shit together, and I think it's documentarian. Get your shit together and stay on point. Stay on. Stay focused on the prize. Don't like. Don't be so scatterbrained with your shit. Do your second episode about what what you like the broken windows kind of crime shit, which is very different than stalking. Um. So yeah, that was get your shit together, and uh, now we're gonna move on to down ballot watch where we cover uh, local politics here in the Bay Area. Um. It looks like tomorrow, uh, Santa Clara County, the county that I live in, is going to lift their mask mandate. So we got a local news hit on that. This is from KPIX5, the CBS affiliate here in the Bay Area. Now on KPIX5 and streaming on CBS News Bay Area, Santa Clara County now confirms it will lift its mask mandate in just a matter of hours. Good afternoon. I'm Lynn Keats. I'm Amanda Starantino. Santa Clara County health officials say the indoor mask mandate will be lifted tomorrow. KPIX5's Jocelyn Moran explains what that means for you. Well, Santa Clara County has met the metrics to lift its indoor mask mandate. And with the state announcing that even those who are unvaccinated can take off their masks, the county will align with the state starting tomorrow. You'll be able to take off your mask in most public indoor places, regardless of your vaccination status, except for settings like public transit, hospitals, and homeless shelters. As of tomorrow, March 2nd, our masking requirement will transition to a strong recommendation for indoor masking. As a reminder, though, some business owners can still choose to require masks if they want to. The county will also be aligning with the state on March 12th when it comes to schools. The masking requirement in K-12 schools and child care settings will drop, although it's still strongly recommended to wear a mask in these settings. The schools will follow the state guidelines. As Santa Clara County eases its masking rules, the residents we spoke with say they'll follow what each business decides to require. Others say they're not quite ready to give up their face covering. Frankly, like everybody, I'm ready to just get back to work. I'm in the travel business, and so hopefully if people are able to stay safe and not, you know, contract anything, this will be good for business. Indoors, I'm still reluctant, and I will continue to wear mine. I have an elderly father, and even if I didn't, there's little people running around who cannot get vaccinated. In Santa Clara County, Jocelyn Moran, KPIX 5. And we brought you the announcement live on CBS News Bay Area. Today we are streaming all day, all night on KPIX.com and on the KPIX app. Uh, sorry, I let them let their little ad in, but I guess I use their content for free here. <clears throat> this is good, I guess. Whatever. Like, you know, this wasn't going to go forever. I'll still wear mine at the store and shit. I think it's polite, the polite thing to do. Um... Maybe not so much at bars and clubs. I know that's like fucking stupid because everybody's drunk and going to be close talking, but whatever. Um, I just think we're going to run into a problem here where if some store business is still requiring the masks then we're going to get back to where fucking people are like yelling at them saying, well, that's illegal because the county isn't requiring the mask. And so I think we're going to see a few of the, few isolated incidents of that possibly around Santa Clara County. Though this county's generally not um, hasn't been known for that. Uh, towards the beginning of the mask mandate, we were covering this guy, Easy Believism, who they were going maskless shopping, but <clears throat> they one day stopped doing it. I think they one, one of them probably got arrested. And um, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I'll keep wearing that shit at the store. 
like grocery store, 7-Eleven, that kind of stuff. Or if I go like, if I'm going to like pick up some to go, I'll definitely wear my mask. But it'll be nice not to have to wear one at the bar, to be perfectly honest. Because if you're going into the bar, like other people aren't really obeying the mask rule anyway. And the mask is more for me to protect you if I'm sick than for me to protect myself. It does offer some protection from me getting sick, but not as much as me transmitting. And if other people at the bar aren't obeying the mask rule, then, you know, what it's the, the benefit to me of wearing one is limited. Um, it'll be good for nightlife. And I hope that, hope that it's the right time. And I hope we don't see a big spread again. Um, because I know last time when the mask mandates were lifted temporarily, we saw a pretty big spread, a pretty big spike here in Santa Clara County because it's a dense place. Not only is it a dense place, there's a lot of business travel. People are coming from other places. And, you know, we'll just have to fucking see. They didn't mention the airport. I bet you still got to wear the mask at the airport and on the airplanes. I'm glad they didn't lift it for transit, but I think that's a state regulation. <clears throat> also, as far as the schools go, that's a state regulation here in California. I think the, the school board could still require it, but I think after everybody going and yelling at the school board over and over and over and over and over again for the last couple of years, I think school boards are just like, fuck it. And so kind of that's where we're at. I'm, um, I'm hopeful that this was the right decision. And I'm hopeful that I've said this so many times, but I'm hopeful that we're getting towards the end of like the worst of this and that we end up with an endemic situation like the flu. It'll be more deadly than the flu for years to come, but I hope we end up endemic and I hope it eventually just becomes another thing like the flu where you're yearly shot some people get it most people don't and that's the way it goes because that seems like the only what the only thing that's going to going to happen here we're not going to end up in a situation where we've all but eradicated it because pe- countries like america like what fucking 40 percent of people just refuse to get the vaccine so like what are you going to do what are you going to do we're fucked we had the worst response of any developed rich nation And it was a tale of two Americas again, where the cities had a pretty good response and the less dense areas had a shitty response because of the way people, people in cities like are like more community minded. They care more about their neighbors and they understand the population density is real good for a virus. We're going to move on to the homeless problem here in San Jose. It's going to be a, going to do a little census of in Santa Clara County of, uh, the unhoused population, homeless folks. They haven't done one since 2019. Santa Clara County is doing a homeless head count for the first time since 2019. It was postponed twice because of the pandemic. And as Len Ramirez reports, early numbers suggest fewer people are living on the streets. Well, the new data is encouraging, but both policymakers and homeless advocates on the ground say it's too soon to tell if the numbers are actually in decline. And so everyone is waiting for the results of this latest homeless census, the first to take place in two years. For the past two early morning, census workers have been fanning out across the homeless camps in Santa Clara County, counting the number of people they see. The results won't be known for weeks, but new data showing how many people are seeking homeless services for the first time is down 33%, perhaps pointing to successful efforts to prevent homelessness. Well, I think it's really uh, encouraging to see that this this number is actually coming down. Supervisor Otto Lee says we could be seeing the impact of 2016's Measure A bond, which raised $950 million to build hundreds of affordable housing units. Many of the 40 construction projects are already built and operating. Others are still breaking ground. And these are certainly important milestones that we wouldn't be able to do without that funding. I want to give a shout out to everybody who's, you know, who's built housing for the unhoused. But Pastor Scott Wagers, who's been on the front lines of San Jose's homeless crisis for three decades, says it's too soon to celebrate. I have never seen the tide turn. And I've heard a lot of speculation about this year the tide's going to turn. Every year the tide <laughs> kept rising. Wagers is waiting for the new census counts, but says the only number that really matters to him is how many unhoused people die on the streets. And last year that number was up dramatically. Well, in 2021, there were 250 deaths, and the year before, there was 198. Lynn, who spent eight years on the streets, was one of the lucky ones. I went to the shelter, and I was able to get into the first permanent supportive housing. She now has a home and a job and volunteers serving meals to the unhoused, hoping they too will soon come in from the cold. In San Jose, Len Ramitas, KPIX5. 
That pastor they showed is a G. We've seen him before. I'd love to get him on the show. Because he was like, hey, you know, you may be, he's like, it's not time to celebrate. More people died last year than the year before. We used to be pretty fucking hard on religion and churches and shit around here. But as basically a couple things happened. One, we just generally softened our positions on these things. But also as like, you can thank the, uh, the shitty atheists who like want to do IQ tests and measure people's skulls and shit and don't like trans people for that too. Because then we're like, well, you know, most religious people are nice. Most of the famous atheists are dicks. So, you know, it's, it's a confluence of events. And um, I hope the number of uh, homeless people has gone down, but it's like really hard to get a count because a lot of people who are, who are homeless, they're not trying to be counted. Would you? Would you be trying to be counted? I don't think I'd be. And so it's, you know, it's just a little bit, it's a little bit difficult to get an accurate count. But we'll see, we'll see what happens. We'll see what the count looks like. And uh, hopefully, hopefully this one of the richest counties in the fucking world can do a little bit more to help. <clears throat> so we usually close this show. Well, we usually close this show out with an animal interest story for and another thing. But there's no animal interest story. But I did find something terrifying. And we're going to close out with that. It's a hella saw. And that's not H-E-L-L-A saw. It's H E L I saw like hella saw like helicopter, but a saw. And here's the story. It's fucking terrifying. pg and is in trouble tonight for using a dramatic and innovative method to quickly clear tree limbs from power lines. The idea is to prevent sparking wildfires, but investigative reporter Jackson Vanderbecken tells us the way the utility used that technology is under attack. This is the aptly named Hellasaw, an array of eight 30-inch diameter whirling blades dangling from a high-performance chopper. There's not much comparable to the Hellasaw. In this recent promotional video, pg &E shows off the device, touting it as a highly effective weapon to combat the threat of live power lines sparking wildfires. The Hellasaw makes quick work of what would otherwise take days to clear the line here. But San Mateo County Parks officials tell us they had no idea what was coming when pg &E unleashed the giant buzzsaw at Wonderlick Park above Woodside back in December. Here among the towering redwoods, the signs of pg and &E's Hellasaw are everywhere. Those branches had grown too close to this high voltage line near Skyline Boulevard, creating a potential fire danger. But now they are down, the limbs pose a fire hazard on the ground, Cal Fire says. And the ripped bark can make trees vulnerable to disease. Cal Fire recently issued this notice of violation against PG&E, accusing the utility of not getting a permit and going back on its word to parks officials not to use the saw here. Cal Fire says the unannounced December 9th operation easily could have put hikers in harm's way from thousands of chopped limbs falling near trails at the popular park although there's no indication anybody actually got hurt this is important work but it's also dangerous work state assemblyman mark berman told us he wants to make sure pg e doesn't go overboard as it tries to prevent wildfires using helisaws i imagine that makes sense in certain circumstances but it has to be done in a safe and smart way in a statement, pg e says its helisaw contractor mistakenly strayed several hundred feet onto parkland because ground crews were on hand at the park, the utility says, there were no safety issues, nor was the public in danger at any time. Cal Fire has recently accused the utility of not getting permits for other recent vegetation management efforts, but pg e disputes it needs them, and it's concerned the permit process could bar it from getting all of its fire control work done. But Berman says permits are designed to protect people and the environment. But we cannot substitute safety for speed. Uh, and that's a concern that I have about what PG&E was doing coming into, in this case, Wonderlick Park in San Mateo County, but also coming into other parks uh, across Northern California. PG&E says it's conferring with Cal Fire over the Hellasaw related violation notice and the permit question. Jackson Vanderbecken, NBC, Bay Area News. If you have a story for Jackson or anyone in our investigation. Oh God, so there's like, listen. There's nothing more terrifying than combining a helicopter and a saw, <laughs> right? Like, I don't care. This is fucking terrifying. When I first saw it, I thought it was like a drone. I thought it was like a, like it was like a hella saw. I thought it was like a quadcopter with a saw on it, but no, it's actually more terrifying. It's like, it's just this fucking 
array of saws dangling from a fucking helicopter. And like, if it's supposed to clear stuff away from power lines, I don't think they can clear stuff away from power lines with it because it's not accurate enough. There's no way you're going to get within 10 feet of a power line with that fucking thing. Cause then you're just going to cut the power line down and start a forest fire. Holy shit. That's terrifying. I don't know. Is anybody here in favor of the hella saw? Like the way you saw it on that video, are you in favor of it? Cause I certainly am not. I think it's not effective. And if it were to get, if you were to try to get anywhere near the power line, just cut the fucking power lines down. And now you got down power lines and you're starting to fucking fire. <laughs> so I was like mostly angry about the unreal estate story about the fucking selling fucking millions of dollars worth of property in the metaverse while people can't fucking pay their rent or maybe even buy a starter home if that's kind of where they're supposed to be at in their life. But that hell, that hella saw thing pisses me off too. It just sounds like somebody's like, Oh, let's attach a saw to a helicopter. America. <laughs> I, in fact, I don't think any other country would use the hella saw. Would they? I think that's definitely an America thing. I think it's very unlikely that other countries would use the hella saw. Although I'm surprised it was in California because that sounds like a very Texas thing to do. Yeah, it's PG&E. PG&E will just do whatever the dumbest thing they can possibly do is. And then when they fucking get in trouble for it, they'll pass the fuck. They'll pass that fucking fee and those fines and shit onto you. California needs to take over and do municipal power, not municipal power, statewide power. Then it needs to be a needs to be a public utility. That'll never happen, though. And that's down ballot. You can check the show out on your favorite podcatcher, of course. You can tune in live every Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. And uh, everybody watching live, don't go nowhere. We're going to be doing uh, Local Love next. Chip DeVille is going to be coming by soon. And um, we'll probably start Local Love a little early tonight because we got out of here pretty quick. The councilman will be back with me next week. He's having some uh, technical issues with his internet, mostly his Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi is evil. And, um, the councilman helped me with the docket though, as he does every week, even if he can't make the show, uh, everybody, thanks for joining me. This is locals by audible smoke. And we'll be back with local love in just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> To get the party started Pick up my phone Just to check and see who's calling Dress up real nice For the ladies at the bar And I'm driving in my car Just to get to where they are Here at the local scene Is where I plant my feet It's where I smoke my cigarette And I hold my drink I look at all my friends They're all blazing greens Here at the front of the stage Waiting for FTV Where are those guys Who's standing next to me With a pipe in his hand Ready to blaze for me About five minutes later We're all singing queen Now get the fuck up on and like the sea, yeah. We do what we want, and what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band. We do what we want, and what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band. Enjoy the band. I turn and head back to the bar for a refill, man, because you know where we are. We're headed out to the car to smoke another one what? and another one. Woo! Now, just when the magic starts kicking in, I hear we left playing, and you know it's time to head in. All right, everybody, now it's time to grab a new drink, spark it if you got it, and then pass it to me. Yeah. We do what we want. And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band We do what we want What we want to do And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Enjoy the band Last up on the field for the show tonight It's down me dirty and five So we're headed outside Just spark up another joint now Who's got my lighter? Stoner E, of course Shouldn't you be inside? I'm all up in this bitch being who I gotta be I'm fucked up like the US economy The truth is, is that I don't think logically Stone to E, take you on a 
psychedelic odyssey Now inside motherfuckers is rockin' me And outside shit we smoke a lot of broccoli Rockin' the rollie, all the sexy girl be jockin' me Ain't too drunk to fuck, but don't probably do it stop We do what we want What we wanna do And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we